Say a few words. Mr. Botello is former Minister of Foreign Affairs and is a good friend of Jamaat since many years. He will also present the keys of a new building to Huzuri Akhtas. Santidade, líder supremo da comunidade islâmica Ahmadiyya, senhores delegados convidados para a Jalsa Salana 2019, caros irmãos e irmãs, permita-me, em primeiro lugar, transmitir a sua santidade, líder supremo da comunidade islâmica Ahmadiyya, os agradecimentos de sua excelência Evaristo do Espírito Santo de Carvalho, Presidente da República Democrática de Santo Meio Príncipe, pelo convite que lhe foi formulado para participar neste tão importante evento, mas que lamenta não poder estar presente pelo facto dos múltiplos e inadiáveis assuntos da sua agenda nacional. Outro sim, gostaríamos, em nome da República Democrática de Santo Meio Príncipe, de felicitar a Jama Hat Islâmica Hamadia de Alemanha, pelo excelente nível de organização e agradecer aos organizadores da Jalsa Salana Alemanha 2019 pela fraternidade que nos foi reservada. É com profunda gratidão que acompanhamos o trabalho da comunidade muçulmana Hamadia e da ONG Humanity Farce em Santo Meio e Príncipe nos vários domínios de intervenção social, desde a saúde, a educação, até aos cuidados básicos de proteção social, com o objetivo de melhorar a vida das populações nas comunidades mais distantes de Santo Meio e Príncipe. O Governo de Santo Meio e Príncipe vem trabalhando num contexto econômico-financeiro internacional desafiante, por forma a criar as condições básicas para o desenvolvimento do país e espera poder contar sempre com a colaboração da vossa comunidade. A Humanity First tem colaborado neste processo e destacamos a construção e apetrechamento de escolas nas comunidades rurais e o novo projeto de bolsas de estudo para mais de 300 crianças do ensino secundário da nona à 12 classe de escolaridade realização periódica de campos médicos em todo o país e cirurgias no Hospital 
Aires de Menezes. A nível de apoio aos carenciados e sinistrados, a presença da Human First tem sido relevante, de igual modo com a construção de casas sociais aos sinistrados de incêndios e apoio alimentar aos mesmos. Por todo esse excelente trabalho realizado em Santo Meio Príncipe pela Human First, uma palavra de agradecimento e encorajamento à Sua Santidade, o líder supremo da comunidade islâmica Hamadiyah, pela prestação de suporte financeiro a estes trabalhos e dizer que Santo Meio Príncipe espera e conta com a vossa mais e melhor intervenção. O projeto de construção de um hospital de referência está em negociações avançadas com o Governo e marcará uma etapa de ouro para a prestação dos cuidados de saúde à população de Santo Meio Príncipe, tendo o Governo atual cedido o edifício da Roça, o Babudo, a Humanity First, para a efetivação deste projeto. Ao terminar, quero aqui manifestar a total disponibilidade de Santo Meio Príncipe em manter e reforçar uma ação e profícua relação de amizade e de cooperação com a comunidade islâmica Hamadiyah, bem como a Human Farce. Em nome do Presidente da República Democrática de Santo Meio Príncipe, gostaria de aproveitar esta oportunidade para proceder à entrega simbólica da chave do Hospital de Santana à Sua Santidade e gostaria de convidar a Sua Santidade a visitar o nosso país e proceder à inauguração do edifício do hospital, o que para nós seria uma grande e incalculável honra. Um bem aja a todos e muito obrigado pela vossa atenção. A Vossa Excelência, por favor, aceita a chave simbólica. Your Holiness, Supreme Leader of Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, respected delegates, Fajal Saslana, dear brothers and sisters. First of all, I would like to convey the gratitude of His Excellency Avaristu de Espiritu Santo de Carvalho, President of the Democratic Republic of São Tomé and Príncipe, to His Holiness for the invitation to participate in this remarkable event. He regrets that he cannot be present in person due to, due to the multiple duties. With deep appreciation, we accompany the work of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and the NGO Humanity First in São Tomé and Príncipe in various fields of social welfare, like healthcare, education, and basic care of social protection with the aim of improving the life of the population in the most remote communities of our country. To mention some of the projects, Humanity First has been constructing and equipping schools in rural communities. Furthermore, they are regularly organizing medical camps and surgical camps. In the support to the needy and the injured, the presence of Humanity First has also been beneficial. For all this excellent work done by Humanity First, I would like to thank His Holiness for emphasizing the need for support in São Tomé and Príncipe. The project of a reference hospital is in advanced negotiations with the government and will mark a golden stage for the provision of health care to the population of São Tomé and Príncipe. For this purpose, the current government has given the building of Rosa Ubabudu to Humanity First. At the end, I would like to assure you that São Tomé and Príncipe is ready and willing to maintain and strengthen a good relationship with the Ahmadiyya Muslim community and Humanity First. On behalf of the President of Democratic Republic of São Tomé and Príncipe, I would like to use this opportunity to proceed with the symbolic delivery of the key of the hospital in Santana to His Holiness. And I would like to invite His Holiness to visit our country on the event of the inauguration of this hospital, which, could be, which would be a great and incalculable honor for us. 
Thanks for your attention. Your Holiness, please accept the symbolic appeal. Thank you very much. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال وقال إنني من المسلمين ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فائز الذي بينك وبين بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حز عظيم. Nun folgt die deutsche Übersetzung der soeben vorgetragenen Verse aus Surat Hamim Sajda, Vers. 34 bis 36. Im Namen Allahs, des Gnädigen, des immer Barmherzigen. Und wer ist besser in der Rede als einer, der zu Allah ruft und Gutes tut und spricht? Ich bin einer der Gottergebenen. Gut und Böse sind nicht gleich. Wäre das Böse mit dem ab, was das Beste ist, und siehe, den Feindschaft zwischen dir und einem anderen, so wird er wie ein warmherziger Freund werden. Aber dies wird nur denen gewähren, die standhaft sind. 
und keinem wird es gewährt als dem Besitzer großer Seelennadels. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our guests who have come to attend our annual convention, that is Jalsa Salana. The Jalsa Salana is purely a religious gathering in which Ahmadi Muslims join together for the sake of increasing their spirituality and morality and furthering their religious knowledge. During our convention here in Germany, it has become a tradition for us to hold a session specifically for the benefit of uh, our Muslim and non-Muslim guests. And it is for that purpose that we are gathered here at this time. Some of you will have come to our events in the past and will be aware of the beliefs of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. However, there will be other guests who have joined us for the first time in order to learn about our community and about our beliefs and practices. By now, such guests may be aware that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is a sect within Islam that was founded by, uh, for the sake of the spiritual reformation of mankind in accordance with a prof prophecy of the founder of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, regarding the latter days. It is a natural phenomenon and that applies not only to secular organizations, but also to religious communities that with the passing of time, the adherent of a particular adherence of a particular movement or belief begin to deviate from their original teachings and move away from their core beliefs. As a result, there comes a time in the life of all groups or communities when they need reviving. Otherwise, they will eventually die away or morph into something that bears no resemblance to their initial state. We believe that when it comes to religion, religious communities, in order to keep the original teachings alive, it is the practice of God Almighty to, to send his chosen representatives to reform and guide people back towards their original beliefs and practices. In terms of Islam, we believe that the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was the final law-bearing prophet sent by Allah the Almighty. And then, in the late 19th century, in order to revive and restore the Islam that taught and practiced, uh, that he taught and practiced, Allah the Almighty sent a reformer in the person of the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Thus, we believe our community is founder to be the promised Messiah and the Mahdi, the guided one. And his paramount objective 
was rejuvenate, uh, to rejuvenate the true teachings of Islam and to bring mankind back towards God Almighty. Following this belief introduction, uh, brief introduction to our community, I now wish to move on and speak about the current state of the world. It is human nature for a person to want to live with freedom, autonomy, and in comfort. It is natural to crave a life of peace and contentment, free from all forms of conflicts. Everyone yearns to live in a place of peace and security. Every person desires for his village, town, or city to be harmonious and secure. Everyone wants their nation to be peaceful, to thrive, and to be equipped with all those things that make life comfortable. <clears throat> Ultimately, people inherently desire for the entire world to be peaceful. However, in spite of this instinctive desire for peace, the truth is that deviant, disorder, and conflict has spread to every part of the world. For instance, there are nations being torn apart by civil wars. In, uh, insurgent groups are fighting one another or targeting the state. In some countries, bitter rivalries and hostilities between the people of different provinces or regions are undermining the peace of their societies. Furthermore, in countries where there has been widespread immigration, tensions and grudges between the indigenous citizens and the immigrants have risen to the surface. Fractured societies are becoming ever more polarized and are rapidly reaching a breaking point with tension, uh, tension threatening to boil over at any point. At an international level, various nations are competing with one another in an effort to gain power and control. For the sake of attaining economic or geopolitical powers, uh, or in order to force people with different values or beliefs to bend to their will, unjust wars are taking place. For example, economic and trade wars have started in order to assert dominance and to hinder the growth of rival nations. Furthermore, the world is being plagued by the blood-soaked stain of conventional warfare in which destructive weapons of mass destruction are being used to crush nations and to extinguish the future prospects of the coming generations. In our selfish quest for wealth and power, we are ruthlessly destroying the prospects of today's youth through a never-ending stream of perpetual injustice and savage cruelty. A disrespect, a desperate, yet very tangible fear is that what we are witnessing today could at any moment escalate into a truly global catastrophe whose dire consequences are far beyond our imagination. In short, 
it is difficult to identify any part of the world that may be classed as secure and free from dissension and strife. Frequently, certain major powers use their might and wealth to force weaker nations to conform to their will. Even some of the lesser powers with the backing of powerful allies use unjust means against their neighbor countries in order to assert their regional dominance. In addition, terrorist groups continue to pursue violence and bloodshed in order to fulfill their Western interests. Furthermore, some so-called religious organizations deceivingly use the name of religion to justify extremism when their real objective is to acquire wealth and power. Increasingly, the far right poses a prof profound and ominous threat to the peace and well-being of Europe and other parts of the world. Far-right members, in the name of nationalism, advocate an end to modern-day multicultural and pluralistic societies, and instead seek to impose their own racist and prejudiced racist and prejudiced ideologies on society. For the sake of protecting what they consider to be their nation's identity and purity, intolerant bigots are viciously targeting immigrants, many of whom have lived peacefully for decades in their adopted countries and have contributed to its success as model citizens. In addition, disregarding basic principles of ethics and fairness, certain nations are, or groups are sparing no effort in their quest to take control of the world's financial markets and business interests for the sake of their personal enrichment at the cost of others. In summary, as I have already said, conflict is prevalent throughout the world and visible at every level of society. Thus, despite our innate desire for peace to prevail, we are seeing the polar opposite come to pass. I have expressed my concerns about the deteriorating state of the world for several years, and now increasingly, uh, increasingly other people are also raising their voice, voice to articulate their fears about the world's lack of peace and security. Hence, I shall now mention recent statements made by certain geopolitical experts, politicians, and analysts who are, who are openly asserting their apprehension and are calling for restraint and urgent reform in order to safeguard the peace and security of the world. <clears throat> for example, in a recent article for the New York Times, the outgoing French ambassador to the United Nations, Franco S. Delator writes, if I have pronounced the correct name, that my experience at the United Nations Security Council over the last five years has, me, has led me to see a harsh truth. The world is growing more dangerous and less predictable by the day. While, he says, while the tectonic plates of power are shifting under our feet, driven in no small part by the combined effects of 
the technology revolution and the rise of China, we are also witnessing the return of heightened com competition among the major powers. We are now in a new world disorder. He says, we are now in a new world disorder. The major power <clears throat> powers claim to be acting benevolently in order to maintain the status quo or to establish a new and improved world order. But here, a senior Western diplomat who has seen the inner workings of international relations and politics openly admits that to the contrary, uh, the, uh, to the contrary all they are doing is leading the world towards a new world disorder. The French ambassador <laughs> has further stated <clears throat> each serious international crisis <clears throat> has the potential to spin out of control. That is what we saw happen in Syria and what we need to prevent with Iran and North Korea and in the South China Sea. Whilst it is true that Syria and Iran are Muslim countries, neither North Korea nor the countries involved in the South China, sea dispute, uh, uh, South China Sea dispute have any link to Islam. And so it cannot be said that the world's disorder is only based around Muslims or Muslim countries as is often perceived. In the aforementioned article, the French ambassador also spoke about Europe's crucial role in maintaining the peace of the world. He writes, my deep conviction is that Europe has both the historical responsibility and the means to become one of the major centers of action and influence in a multipolar world. In its, uh, it is Europe's duty to act as a link, a connector, and a balancing power for the world. Some time ago, I met with a German politician who was working for an organization <coughs> set by the German government to build bridges between the immigrant population and the local German people. I advised him that the issues at hand were not for Germany, to solve on their own, or for any other individual nation. Rather, all European nations needed to work together and with the spirit of unity if they wanted to achieve lasting peace. <clears throat> In a recent article, Professor Narel Rubini, who was a senior econo economist for international affairs in the White House, during the Clinton administration writes, <coughs> writes about the relationship between the United States and China. Professor Rubini writes, the global consequences of a China-American Cold War would be even more severe than those of the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union. <coughs> Professor Rubini further states, a full-scale Cold War <clears throat> thus could trigger a new stage of deglobalization or at least a division of the global economy into two incompatible economic blocks. <clears throat> in either scenario, trade in goods, services, capital, lab labor, technology, and data would, severely <clears throat> would be severely restricted. <clears throat> this article gives an insight into some of the harmful consequences of the trade and economic war between the world's superpowers. Although some few days ago there has been an agreement 
between China and America, but let us see how far it becomes fruitful. <clears throat> While such trade wars are reckless and irrational, my greatest fear remains the potential of a nuclear war break, uh, breaking out. The calam calamitous and heartbreaking consequences of such a war do not bear thinking about and would surely extend for generations to come. More and more other people are now also highlighting this risk. In an article for Bloomberg, Professor Taylor Cohen, an economist professor at George Mason University, writes, one of the most striking facts of today's world is that young people do not seem to worry very much about nuclear war. Climate change is by far the larger concern, while nuclear war is seen as a threat of the past. In contrast, he says, in contrast, I am inclined to think that the risk of nuclear war remains the world's number one problem, even if that risk does not seem so pressing on, many uh, on any particular day. He goes on to say that some smaller countries have acquired nuclear weapons, whilst other nations are seeking to obtain them, and so the risk of nuclear warfare continues to rise. He solemnly notes that it would require only one nation or group to launch a nuclear missile to change the world forever. A recent survey published by Dushwele found, if it is the right pronunciation anyway, that uh, the issue German people are most concerned about is climate change. But personally, I agree with the sentiments of the aforementioned academic that the risk of warfare and most especially nuclear warfare is the most pressing issue of our time. Earlier this year, Germany's former foreign minister, Sigmar Gabriel, also expressed his concern about the proliferation of nuclear weapons. He stated that the United States, Russia, and China were now engaged in a new nuclear arms race, and that it was likely that nuclear missiles would be stationed in Europe by the United States and Russia, and that in such a scenario, European countries would be viewed merely as collateral damage in the pursuit of nuclear supremacy. Furthermore, tensions between the United States and Iran are ratcheting up at their, uh, and, and uh, there is intense speculation about the possibility of a war between them. No one can seriously claim that the potential war between the United States and Iran is a religious war. On the contrary, it is a prime example of irresponsible, saber rattling, and unnecessary belligerence putting at risk the lives of millions of people. Political analysts have noted that if a war erupts between the United States and Iran, then it effect, its effect, uh, effect will not be limited to the two countries, but will spread much further afield. Certainly, Germany and other European countries would surely be affected by the devastating fallout of such a war. Hence, Germany's government and other European nations must take a lead in urging, strength, uh, urging restraint and de-escalation. Moreover, 
a decade on from the global financial crisis, the European countries should not think that their national economies are secure or that the capitalist system is thriving. Even Western experts and economists are accepting the, uh, the shortcoming of their financial system. For example, in a recent article for Economic, uh, Economia magazine, a well-known economist, Paul Cairns, Kera, uh, writes, we have all benefited from capitalism, but it is a system that must now be redesigned to heal itself. It has to be driven explicitly by social values, not profit. Hence, the capitalist system is slowly losing its status, and people are realizing that there are inherent risks and injustices embedded within it. Consequently, European countries and the other major powers should not arrogantly presume that their economic system will remain preeminent forevermore. Rather, they should be working to ensure that fairness and equality underpin the world's financial system. Another concerning issue that is adding to the uncertainty in, European, uh, in Europe is Brexit and its potential uh, ramifications. Just recently, Deutsche Welle cited a study outlining the harmful consequences across Europe, uh, European Union of the Brexit crisis. The report stated that Germany would be particularly affected by hard Brexit and it could easily cause widespread damage to Germany's uh, automotive and technology industries. And that, that in Germany alone, 100,000 jobs could be lost. Another issue that has been the cause of frustration and been used repeatedly to incite discord in many parts of the world, including here in Germany is immigration. Despite being such a contentious issue, the truth is that immigration is actually an indispensable necessity for thriving economies. For example, a recent study by the Bertelsmann Foundation found that in order to meet the basic labor demand in Germany, 260,000 immigrants were required annually to move to this country to, pre to prevent a labor shortage. The report goes on to state that due to its aging population, the labor force in Germany is likely to shrink by a third, or 16 million people by 2060 without immigration. So, to blame immigrants for all of a country's problem is entirely unjust. And the truth is that many wealthy Western nations would be at grave risk without immigration. The reality is that all nations are dependent upon one another. And that we are now living in an increasingly interconnected and globalized world. Instead of seeking to build bar uh, barriers or to isolate ourselves, it is essential that nations and people of different backgrounds cooperate and work together for the common good. For this, governments should make proper plans to ensure that countries work in harmony with each other, and that at a domestic level, Immigrants are helped to assimilate and integrate. For, a, for decades, the situation in the Middle East has been volatile and incendiary. Uh, Countless peace plans seeking a negotiated settlement between Israel and Palestine have come and gone, all without success. 
Recently, there has been intense speculation about a new peace plan that is said to have been developed by the United States and its allies. However, even before it has been formally unveiled, politicians and experts are saying that the new plans, uh, plan is rooted in injustice and so will not achieve any positive results. In fact, prior to his recent retirement uh, as the French ambassador to the United States, Gerard Arwa stated that the plan was almost certainly doomed to fail. Hence, the world's peace is being undermined by a variety of factors such as the one-eyed policies of political leaders and governments who place their personal and national interests above fairness and equ uh, equity. Such injustice can never lead to peace and prosperity. The various studies and articles I have quoted demonstrate that the blame for the world's lack of peace and security cannot be put at the door of any religion, whether Islam or otherwise. Rather, there are a myriad of economic, geopolitical, and social issues which are all playing a role in undermining the world's peace. At this critical moment in history, I believe with all my heart that there's only one way to bring an end to the great challenges of our time. There is only one path that can lead us to salvation and deliver us from, their, uh, from this world of war and conflict, and that is the path of God Almighty. Peace does not lie in power or wealth. Rather, peace lies in the cradle of God Almighty. Thus, it is the need of the hour that mankind comes to recognize its creator. God Almighty desires that mankind who he created as the best of creation should live peacefully and fulfill the rights of one another. Thus, Holy Quran, which is the holy book of Islam and the foremost source of Islamic law, was according to our beliefs revealed by Allah the Almighty to the Holy Prophet Muhammad and we consider it to be the final religious law that will remain until the day of judgment. And in the Quran, Allah the Almighty states that when deviant and disorder spread to all parts of the world, the root cause is a growing distance between mankind and its creator. At such times, when the world is hurtling towards the brink of disaster, out of his infinite grace and mercy, Allah the Almighty sends his chosen representatives to bring humanity back towards religion. In ancient times, prophets came to different parts of the world to guide their people. Then, according to our belief, ultimately, Allah the Almighty sent the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, with a universal and everlasting teaching for the sake of the spiritual and moral reformation of all mankind. As I mentioned at the outset, we Ahmadi Muslim believe that in this era, all Allah the Almighty sent the founder of the Ahmadi Muslim community as a reformer to guide mankind and to shine a light on the true teachings of Islam that had gone, uh, that had uh, long been uh, abandoned and corrupted. He was sent to show Muslims and non-Muslims alike that Islam was a religion of peace, reconciliation, brotherhood, and friendship, and that God Almighty desired for humanity to live in peace and for all people to fill their, uh, fill the right, uh, to fulfill the rights of their Creator and one of one another. Time and time again, the promised Messiah, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him, emphasized that it was not possible to fulfill the rights of God without discharging the rights of his creation. Indeed, the Holy Quran goes as far as saying that the prayers and worship of those who do not fulfill the rights of God's creation are worthless and will be rejected by Allah the Almighty. 
the Prime Messiah, peace be upon him, called on mankind to seek refuge under the shade of God Almighty in order to be saved from all forms of warfare and danger. However, he also warned that if mankind failed in its duties to recognize its creator, then it would be at grave risk. He said that despite their might, wealth, and power, neither Europe nor America would be safe from destruction, nor would Asia, Australia, or islands, or any other part of the world. In light of this, it is my heartfelt prayer that mankind comes to recognize its creator and learn towards him uh, and turns to, uh, toward him, towards him rather than continuing to view this material world and its attractions and comforts as the ultimate form of existence. It is my ardent hope and prayer that the people of the world come to understand their duties towards their creator and towards their fellow beings so that the world can become that heaven of peace that we all naturally crave and desire. I pray that we set a positive example for those who follow us so that the coming generations seek to live in peace rather than being those who stoke for uh, further conflict and division and for whom all roads leading to prosperity and success are sealed. I pray that may the dark clouds of war and enmity hovering ominously all around us give way and may the, they be replaced by uh, eternal blue skies of peace and prosperity in all parts of the world. May Allah the Almighty enable humanity to save itself from impending disaster by turning towards him before it is too late. I mean, at the end, I wish to thank all of you once again for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Eine Heiligkeit wird uns, äh, wie bereits erwähnt, äh, im stillen Gebet leiten. Sie können auf Ihre Art daran teilnehmen. Please silent prayer. Amen. I mean.